Iconic wrestling coach Dan Gable once said, Pain is nothing compared to what it feels like to quit. Give everything you've got today, for tomorrow may never come. Gable could be describing those whose achievements have earned them the honor of being inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. Etched in Stone, the stories of wrestling's legends will take you inside the lives of over 200 of the greatest wrestlers in history as they share their never-before-told stories about their trials, tribulations, and triumphs. Competitors, coaches, teammates, and those who knew these athletes best will also weigh in on their accomplishments with their own unique perspectives. Welcome to the show, folks. You're listening to The Smiths on the Etched in Stone series. My name is Ryan Warner. I'll be your host. So let's get started. After John won his first NCAA title, he entered the U.S. Wrestling Festival. There he won eight matches across three days to qualify for the U.S. World Team. His win streak was now sitting at 54 consecutive victories. Then he flew to France for his first World Championships. Now archival from this event is super rare, but fortunately for us, John's sister-in-law, Lisa Little, was at the event. The 87 World Championships were in Clermont-Ferrand, France. Now John's weight had been dominated by the Soviets. They'd won the world title eight of the last 10 years at 136 and a half pounds. And they wanted revenge for John's win at the Goodwill Games. I can remember in France watching Russian wrestlers warming up, trying, you know, his opponents would have somebody trying to imitate that low single. They knew it was coming, and they couldn't do anything to stop it. John's low single was like a lightsaber at this point, and he used it to perfection that weekend. He advanced through the early rounds all the way to the finals where the Soviet awaited. The same Soviet who he'd beaten at the Goodwill Games, Asayev. Back in on that low single leg. That's the Smith single leg. It's noted around the world now. People are trying to figure out how to stop it, how to emulate it, how to duplicate it. And they're not doing a very good job. No, they're not. The Soviets haven't figured it out yet, that's for sure. And that's that's good. I like that. Again, in on the low single and switching to the double, driving him. John Smith will win the match at 136 and a half pounds. John, congratulations on your first world championship. I know they keep sending different Soviets out for you. They're trying to find your style. So how are you going to prepare for these new guys all the time? Uh, Jim, you know as well as I do that I've got a good style. So you don't prepare for anyone. You just keep preparing your style and come to wrestle the best you can your own style. If you start worrying about other people's style... At just 22 years old, John was one of the youngest world champions in United States history. I talk about it all the time that your first... Your first experiences are the best, you know. I mean, winning my first world championship was, you know, the the greatest experience in my life. With less than a year until the Summer Olympics, the question on everyone's mind was, could anyone stop John Smith or his low single? John Smith. John Smith. John Smith. Probably the greatest wrestler we've ever had in the United States. He took him down. I see a bundle of intensity. I find a way to win. It seems incredible that a family can do that well. Three NCAA champions, the only family to ever do that. It just seems one brother after the other tries to outdo the one before him. A big win for young Pat Smith. Pat Smith, the number one seed and defending champ from Oklahoma State. It was, you know, a wrestling life. You're listening to The Smiths, Episode 3. This is your host, Ryan Warner. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. Let's get started. It's January of 1988, John's senior season at Oklahoma State. He's balancing a full class load, traveling across the globe for freestyle tournaments, and wrestling a full schedule for the Cowboys, during which he's been dominant. So dominant that Sports Illustrated called him the Mike Tyson of wrestling. But even more impressive is how he's doing it with his low single leg, his invention from the redshirt year. It's become the most dominant takedown in wrestling. Now, before John could make a run at the Olympics, which were taking place later that year, he travels to the 1988 NCAA Championships to defend his national title. Smith, so far this tournament, has pinned three people. His other opponent, who he didn't pin, he beat 21 to 8. And he's certainly looking at a shot at the Outstanding Wrestler Award of this tournament. Wrestling in front of a sold-out crowd at the Hilton Coliseum the home of the Iowa State Cyclones, John dominated his first four opponents in 
in advance of the finals. Smith of Oklahoma State, Melchore of Iowa. Here you're going to see Smith try to drag around behind. There you can see him. Boom, he got around behind him. Minute 19 remaining in the match. There Smith has the legs in. He's going to get back points here. Smith thought he had a couple more points coming, but it'll end at 9-2. Smith wins it. The 134-pound champion. John's win in the finals put him second behind Dan Gable for all-time consecutive wins. He had now won 112 matches in a row. Without stepping on anybody's toes, is he the best wrestler in the United States, the best college wrestler, Jeff? With John's college career in the books, he resumed his focus on the Olympics. They were just six months away. But first, John had to make Team USA, which meant wrestling at the Olympic qualifier event in Topeka, Kansas. The top eight from that event would qualify for the final Olympic trials to be held in Pensacola, Florida later that June. Now at the time, John was looking like a shoe in to make the team. He had held the number one world ranking for over 23 months and hadn't been challenged domestically since he lost to Gil Sanchez back in episode two. But then, a new threat emerged from Iowa City, one that would throw John's world upside down and redrudge the demons from 1984. Let's do one final one, Mr. Randy, just state your name, sir. Randy Lewis. That's Randy Lewis. The same Randy Lewis who took out John's brother back in episode one. The same Randy Lewis who was involved in the arbitration debacle. See, after he beat Leroy in the final wrestle-off, Randy won the gold in 84 and retired, gaining upwards of 35 pounds. But now, he was planning a comeback to take out John. And as fate would have it, folks, John and Randy bumped into each other at a blackjack table in Vegas. Here's Randy's side of it. I remember I was drinking and playing blackjack with John Smith. We were playing blackjack together, and we were giving each other some shit, you know, and and, and, uh, and he's telling me that he's, I'm going to attack you. I'm going to turn you. I go, you're going to turn me? No, you're not turning me. I go, you can't stop my gut wrench. I will gut wrench you. I will turn you. And he was telling me he was going to throw me. I go, well, come on upstairs and see what it's like. And we were both getting cocky, but I didn't feel like I could get as cocky as he was because he was the reigning world champ, and I didn't even know if I was going to be able to wrestle. Could you imagine what the other people at this blackjack table were thinking as two of the best freestyle wrestlers in the world traded barbs with one another? Here's John's side of it. I remember playing with him, and I'm sure I I said some of that to him because I probably assumed, you know, you're fat, and you're never going to make weight, and you're never going to be down to my weight, you know. And little, little did I know that, <laughs> he did do it, you know, and so yeah, I I probably said those things and 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 but not knowing that I would wrestling, I know myself well enough. Like you're a compare, I probably wouldn't even been playing cards with him if I if I knew I was going to wrestling. Really? Yeah, no, I don't want a relationship with you, you know, um, you know. I mean, not not because I because you're you're a threat to me. After the blackjack game. Both wrestlers went their separate ways, but it was clear to John that Randy's comeback was legit. That spring, he beat a couple ranked guys and was cemented as the number two ranked wrestler in the U.S. behind John. Randy was good, man. He's as good as any Olympian I ever wrestled in freestyle. He was a freak. And to be off that long comeback and and make a challenge, that just tells you, you know, where, where... he, what he thinks of himself. I mean, that's what's impressive. I don't know if I could ever take two or three years off and come back and go on. I could pick it up right where I left off. You know, I think I'd punish myself like, you're not, you can't do this. You know, he just, like, I'm going to pick up where I left off, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, just people can't do that. He did it, right? Right. And he was better. Now, fortunately for wrestling fans, John and Randy met in the finals at the Topeka Qualifier Tournament. And this was a match for the ages. You had the defending Olympic gold medalist, Randy Lewis, versus John Smith, the defending world champ, plus all the baggage from the 1984 arbitration debacle. 
when you say John and Randy and you know um, it was such a you know the backstory too with Leroy Smith you know having it going to court and Leroy gets taken I want I want I don't want to say taken off the team but you know, it was just about that you're hearing from Kendall Cross he was a sophomore at Oklahoma State and one of John's main workout partners he was at the tournament in Topeka and then on top of it the serious conflict of styles where you've got arguably the best low-level shooter in the world, and then arguably the best counter-wrestler in the world. And what's going to happen? What's it going to look like? We'd soon find out as John and Randy stepped on the mat for the 136-and-a-half-pound final. The winner would get an automatic bye to the finals of the Olympic trials. Here at the peak of Kansas, where we're at the Kansas Expo Center, a really nice setting for tough competitive freestyle wrestling in the year of our Lord, 1988. John carried a staggering 131 match win streak into the finals. His brother-in-law, Chuck White, also in the stands, was feeling confident. Match in Topeka started out kind of like normal John match, low single, you know, looking pretty good. And then at some point, he just goes up top with Randy, which is like not a good idea, you know, obviously because John landed on his head. To the shock of everyone in the arena, John was thrown to his back by Randy and was now losing by a point. But guess what? You know, as strong as he is, he couldn't hold me on my back. True. John did get off his back, but ego inflamed, ignoring the advice from his coaches, he went right into Randy's strongest position. A huge mistake. I was stubborn, you know. It was almost like he's not stopping my high crotch. Randy did stop it and handed John his first loss since Gil Sanchez. It was a it was a shocking moment for me, right? You know, and it, it's the first time I, I walked away, you know, and learned another lesson. Listen. There's people better than you in certain positions. You better respect it. Chuck and the rest of the onlookers were stunned. You know, and it's like, hey, didn't we, like, win the world championship last year? <laughs> What's going on here? And all, all I remember is my father-in-law on the ride home. He said, you know what? You know, if you want to go up top with Randy Lewis and try to wrestle like that, you deserve to get beat. You just deserve to get beat. But, I mean, that's... Uh, it, I mean, I think that's where the boys got the zero excuse making was f from their dad, you know, because he never, never BS'd them. He always just told them how it was. There's only one valid excuse for defeat. And that's that the only valid excuse is that I did not work hard enough. The loss to Randy was a major blow to John's chances of making the Olympic team. Now... He'd have to beat Randy in a best-of-three series in Pensacola, Florida, just four weeks away. He wasted no time sulking. But that night, John, John, you, you didn't have to look for John to get him to come watch video of his matches. You're hearing from Bruce Burnett. He would go on to coach several Olympic teams. But that night, he was John's coach and was with him when he watched the match film. John went to Dave Bennett that night, said, let's watch this, let's find out. And uh, after he did, he basically told Dave, he said, that'll never happen again. When John arrived at the Olympic trials in Florida, he was in for the fight of his life. To make the Olympic team, he'd have to win two matches against Randy Lewis in a best of three series. You know, I think what people forget a lot of times is, you know, um, I had legitimate threats. If I didn't wrestle good, I wasn't going to make the Olympic team. That was just not something that that was an option. I mean, I just kept thinking, I have to do this, right? Like, I can't be a world champion from the year before and not make an Olympic team. And so I, I forced that on myself, and it, and it brought out good results in performance-wise. Not anxiety, not nervous, not, you know, it gave me the, the will to lay it out there, as you would say, you know, where you want your, hey, go for it. 
you know, go for this. And again, folks, we can't stress it enough. This is the same Randy Lewis who took out John's brother Leroy just four years prior. Now, we'll never know for sure just how much that impacted John that weekend, but we can ask his friends. Here's Doc Bennett, one of the few people who was in John's inner circle that weekend. I think John always felt that Leroy had been had been shortchanged in his attempt to try to be an Olympic champion, and John was was on a journey. He was going to make up for that. He was going to put, he was he was a Smith, and he was going to put that Smith name out there and be the best you could be. The pressure was so great that weekend that John's sister Kathy couldn't bear to watch the match. To be honest, I didn't stay in the arena. I went out with my mom that time, and I walked in circles around the arena until it was over. You know, in Florida. Uh huh. Yeah. I just, I remember us all traveling there in vans and, um, you know, but I just, for some reason, I just, I just didn't want to be inside. As Kathy and Mrs. Smith paced in the parking lot, inside the Pensacola Civic Center, John and Randy were on the mat, ready for their first match. John's brother-in-law, Chuck White, who had been following our stars since the early 80s, was sitting inside, just a few feet from the mat. He was ready. I mean, there was no doubt that he wasn't ready. But, you know, then the first match, I think he went out there and Randy took him down twice in a row. You know, you're like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen here? You know, and then then John just got, you know, he just started doing what John does. And, you know, and he just won't quit. After trailing to start the match, John hit a low single and then another that took Randy to his back. He was now up four to two and began to pull away. You know, I mean, if you watch any of those films, I mean, he gets a leg and it's just like he's patient. He stays there and eventually they got to move. When they move, he scores. It's just, you know, if you try to beat him, he will crush you. That's kind of how it used to be. John won the first match eight to four. And in the second was leading before Randy blew out his knee and it was over. John was your Olympian. I can't say that there wasn't some... This is Lisa Little, John's sister-in-law. Excitement and celebration, particularly among some of Leroy's sisters, when John beat Randy. And, you know, they all kind of looked at each other and, you know, okay, this is fun, you know. But, um, you know, for, for John and Leroy, that was business. You know, we're, we're just going to take care of it, and we're going to take care of it this time, and we're going to do it right. So what emotion did you feel after you won the trials and were an Olympian? Well, it was, it was relief, you know. There was a lot of relief for me, you know. As John put on the red, white, and blue for the first time as a member of Team USA, Randy Lewis sat backstage. He's the greatest wrestler I ever wrestled. And he beat me when I was at my absolute best. But I gave him all... I gave my all, and before I got hurt, our total score over three and a half matches was he was ahead 26 to 23. That was quite a bit of great action. Great action indeed. And to this day, the Randy Lewis-John Smith series goes down as one of the most hotly contested in wrestling history. Those matches with Randy helped me kind of build my mind of going, listen, you can win however you have to win, but respect people and respect the positions that they're really good in. And so that's what I learned from Randy. In the weeks leading up to the Olympics, John was the hottest commodity in wrestling. He signed an endorsement deal with Brew. We we actually put his shoe contract together in my living room. That's Doc Bennett again. We, I called up Brute and talked to him, and we got it all lined up. They sent the contract out, and he signed it, and we got him a shoe deal at the same time. John was now part of an ultra-rare club that only he and Dan Gable shared, having a custom shoe. But the problem was, USA Wrestling was supposed to wear Nikes at the summer games. I mean, John was a bit of a challenge, I think, for, for you know, at the time, the leadership of, of USA Wrestling as they were trying to navigate through that competitive gear discussion. That's Rich Bender, CEO of USA Wrestling. He was there when John insisted on wearing the brutes. You know, to this day, right, competitive athletes can wear whatever shoes they, they want to wear. With the shoe conflict in the rear view, John packed his bags and boarded a flight for Seoul, Korea. It was time 
for the Summer Games. On the banks of the Han River, Seoul's Olympic Stadium is primed and ready for a world-class festival. In 24 hours, some 100,000 people inside and close to half a million more on the river will cheer the ceremony marking the opening of the Games. The Summer Games were finally here. It was the first time in over 12 years where none of the big countries boycotted. John set up shop in the Olympic Village, with wrestling just 17 days away. In 88, you know, was probably took my experience and it took it even higher of what my expectations was going to be. The village, you know, the food, the people, all the excitement, uh, you know, that, that village in um, Seoul, Korea was just unbelievable and the experience was uh, uh, a lot of fun. As John was taking in the Olympic experience, the Soviet Union pulled into the village. For the past two years, they had been miffed at how to stop the low single. Their answer was strength. Stepan Sarkeesian of the Soviet Union. Sarkeesian was a wrestler that they brought out and pulled down from 149, who was going to be the guy to stop John, and he was extremely good. That's Pat Smith, John's younger brother. At the time of the Olympics, he was a junior in high school. I remember John saying, I, I will never wrestle a guy as strong as Sarkisian. He had been wrestling 149 and a half pounds, you know, and um, just knew going into that tournament, you know, that, that likely I was going to have to go through him. I prepared that I was going to have to go through him to win a, uh, to win a gold medal. Sarkisian was so big and so strong that some accused the Soviet of foul play. Of course, and we're complaining about him, you know, doing drugs and, sh- and, and you know, steroids. I've heard that the whole life. I'm like, uh, you know, to me, I said, well, that's something I got to beat, too. That year, the Olympic field was divided into two pools. Sarkissian was in one, and John was in another. The only time they'd meet would be in the finals. But John had a brutal draw that he had to survive before even getting to Sarkissian. Five of the hardest matches he'd ever wrestle. The United States set to put their first man on the mat, and what a man he is, reigning world champion John Smith. He won the Goodwill Games, the Pan Am Games, the World Championships, plus he's won a couple of NC2A tournaments, so he's very, very experienced in any form of wrestling. In on a nice leg attack, that's that Smith single, very low. In the first round, John knocked off the Hungarian, Joseph Orban. Later that night, he took out the Bulgarian and suffered a broken nose along the way. Get it on a nose shot. He's really looking good. He's very, very smooth. By round four, John was 3-0 and and demolished his opponent from Finland. It is 13-6. 53 seconds left in his period. Smith again back on the leg. Nice takedown. That same single. By the final day of competition, John had made it into the finals. His opponent was the mighty Sarkissian from the Soviet Union. Going into that match, you know, I, I respected his power. Stay out of the tie-up with him. He will throw you around like a doll. Minutes before the finals, John was pacing in the tunnel. He checked his knee pad and looked to his right, where Sarkissian was lurking in the shadows. Back in Oklahoma City, Kathy Perry, John's sister, was tuning into the finals. You know, we had a big office party uh, at a company I worked at, and the the guy that owned the company, he kind of closed down a big department store, and he closed the whole thing down. We went up in the break room. They had food and everything, and we watched the Olympics, and it it was exciting. It was emotional. On Thursday, September 28th, at 8 p.m. local time, John and Sarkissian stepped on the mat with an Olympic gold medal hanging in the balance. And right now we're going to find out who is the best 136 and a half pound wrestler in the world. This could be a great one. My focus early on was make this big strong guy react. You know, make him feel your pressure. Make him feel the threat to his legs. Make him um, put, put some fear in him like I can't grab this guy. I can't get a hold of him. Despite John's plan, Sarkissian was in deep on a single leg early into the match. It looked like the Soviet might even score. Sarkissian in on the leg right away. Smith countering. He's got great flexibility. He might just... There was a level of flexibility I had that night that I didn't realize. Well, we see that oh, he flexibility. Might get the he might get the takedown out of this. He's behind the Soviet. He's got to get a knee down. There it is. 
first point is scored by Smith. The first period was a heavyweight title fight. Both wrestlers exchanging blows, but it ended 1-0 with John in the lead. He was just three minutes away from the Olympic gold medal. Smith is in now. Good leg attack. He's got the Soviet towel, but the Soviet's hanging onto his ankle, and there, he's got the score for the takedown. He's now leading two to nothing. Two minutes and 14 seconds. Leroy into this match just like we are. With a minute 45 left, John was relentless and was in deep again. He needs to hang on to that ankle, and there's the takedown. If Sarkeesian put his head on the back, he might have broken the will of the Soviet with that move. I think when I put my fourth point up uh, late, in the, late in the match, um, with, with time remaining, you know, um, it broke him. And I'm running around. That's going to do it. Sarkeesian doesn't even try and attack. And Smith has won the Olympic Games. At last, folks, our man John Smith was an Olympic gold medalist. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable experience and just accomplishing, you know, the ultimate in your sport, you know, and there's nothing like when you see that flag for the first time, you know. Um, I know my dad was there and that was... That was special. I remember making eye contact with him. And In the days after the Olympics, John celebrated and then flew home to Oklahoma, where hundreds met him at the airport. Fortunately for us, the cameras were rolling when he landed. <laughs> Standing outside gate C8 at the Will Rogers Airport, hundreds waited for their hero, John Smith, to emerge from the gate. And then he did, wearing a black suit, no tie. The crowd erupted. <laughs> After making his way through the mob of people, John returned to Dell City, his hometown, where a championship rally was being thrown. Well, I just want to say thank you. It's very special to know that there's people behind me. And Ever since I started wrestling in Dell City, you know, I've had great coaches, I've had great support, and when I went on through college and international ranks, there was always support there for me. When I was down, there was people to pick me up, whether it was my family, my coaches, or my friends. And thank you for all your support. And that's the end of part three. Be sure to check out episode four to see if John's brother, Pat, could create his own dynasty at Oklahoma State. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you want to help us spread the word, please rate the episode and share it with your friends. The Smiths was written and directed by Ryan Warner. Executive producers include USA Wrestling and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. A special thank you to the entire Smith family, Rich Bender and Leroy Smith. Etched in Stone is an exclusive production of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and USA Wrestling. Download your free souvenir book of any of the Etched in Stone stories produced at nwhof.org. The storybook includes the written story and is filled with pictures and videos of their live matches. And while you're on the website, take a deeper dive into the profiles of the 179 distinguished members inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame.